Hi, and welcome to another episode of the Leadership Enigma. Well, we're now into the 80s for episodes. Can you believe over 80 episodes? While the world continues to go bonkers, there's always change and there's always a crisis. And many would say that there is a void in leadership. And so I needed to wait patiently to invite my next guest back to the show so that he could help me fathom an answer to the question, leadership, so what? What does it mean to us as individuals? What does it mean to our people? What does it mean to our organizations? What does it mean to humanity? It's a big question. So I needed the wonderful John Amici to come back to the show, organizational psychologist, founder of APS Intelligence, New York Times bestselling author. You can see there, the promises of giants just behind you there, John. Look at that, you see, we are both studio geeks and we love it. Dad, brother, uncle, he's a northern lad from Stockport. Hell, he used to play a little bit of basketball in his time and he's an everyday Jedi. And that has been confirmed by Mark Hamill. Trust me, we're going to be coming on to that as well in this wonderful episode, Come Back to Me, where we'll be with John Amici. You're listening to The Leadership Enigma, powered by Transform Performance International, a podcast for the insatiably curious to explore the power of human-centered leadership to create real momentum for positive and sustainable change. Whether you're an entrepreneur, business owner, or corporate executive, each week we speak to global experts, academics, rising stars, ambitious upstarts, and disruptors as we discover that success leaves clues. Now, here's your host, Adam Pacifico. And there we have it, John. It's a massive welcome to you coming back to the Leadership Enigma. Thank you so much. It's been a while. Boy, has the podcast grown up in in just a few episodes. Well, you believed in me and you very kindly, I think you were episode number three. That's right. Um, Let's also let the listeners know as well, you very kindly, remember you allowed me to interview you, uh, which was pre-pandemic now for my book, but we're going to come on to your book, The Promises of Giants Behind You. So this isn't our first rodeo together, and yeah. this certainly isn't your first rodeo because you have been busy the last couple of years. Just tell everyone what you've been up to because a lot of people will have seen, I think, a lot of the work that you've done in the BBC videos. Yeah, I think it's it's been an interesting mix of things, right? So we've been doing the quiet work of APS intelligence, which is mostly to be as invisible as possible while we do come deep analytic work and L&D, learning and development work inside organizations, and yep. nobody knows about it. And then there is the kind of public facing stuff, which it looks like it's me, but really is my entire team behind me. So the BBC bite sized videos talking about privilege, talking about anti-racism, especially in the what, 563 odd days since George Floyd's, George Floyd's murder, sorry. Yeah. So um, that kind of stuff has been going on, but also the fact that you know, almost every day, almost every minute of every day, there is some other example of the the abject paucity of leadership in the world. Yeah. And we're going to really, you know, we're going to zone in on, because I know you've got your book out, The Promises of Giants, how you fill the leadership void. And and so I'm just going to ask you a question. What, look, <laughs> you see, like, I, I love that, John, you see, because that is, we are aligned. We really are in, the, in what we've got at home, the studio. I, I apologize to the listeners already. We're having too much fun. Um, let me ask you a question. Now, I had the pleasure of chatting to you probably two, well, 70 odd episodes ago. Mm-hmm. And remember, I came to uh, your, your London flat, which was great, spent some time with you. And a lot of what you said really resonated with me. You talk, there were things that were in my mind, leadership is energy, energy expensive, interpersonal comfort trumps organizational change. That wonderful quote, I think you, you uh, uh, put into your mother, the, the most unlikely of people and the most improbable of circumstances can become extraordinary. Mm-hmm. So that conversation a real impact on me so what brought you to write this book and in some ways bring it all together to synthesize it tell us a little bit about what was behind that before we get onto the book itself well the book is about three or four years in the making which is way too long for a book of this length um takes time but, 
but it does take time but it mostly took time because it was a it was furtive it was start it was stop it was i'm too busy with other stuff um and then ironically as i got the most busy that we've been in a long time and continued yep. to be it was the time when it was right to get it done but it was actually uh, in part th conversations like the one we had right sitting yeah. in front of people and realizing that the perspectives on leadership evidence based as many of them if not all of them are were seen as valuable so then it, it kind of spurred me on to think well maybe we should get these out in a way that people could follow them in a more programmatic way rather than you've got to catch me for an hour on a podcast if you've got to catch me in somewhere else but here's where if you like the tone of what you're hearing and you're willing to put some real effort in there's now a book out there that can can facilitate your development as a leader and yep. and the, the th i think the big part of this was I wanted people to stop their limited perspective on what a leader is. It, it is not a title or a role. And you've heard me say this a thousand yeah. times, right? It's not a role or a title. It's a promise of a kind of experience. And as such, everyone can be a leader. Everyone can promise that around me, this is the experience. And again, not an easy experience, not, a, not an experience without challenge, but an experience where sport, support and challenge will be offered in equal measure. You know, I loved that when I first heard that, John, you know, a couple of years ago. And I love that now because there's that element of inclusivity as regards anyone and everyone can be a leader. And we've yeah. got to lead ourselves. We've got to really understand ourselves before we even go anywhere near leading other people, haven't we? Yeah, that that's exactly right. I mean, the the book is essentially in three chap three three sections, right? Fourteen chapters, but three sections, and they are introspection, yes, interpersonal, and then organizational. And I think the introspection part is the bit that leaders miss. Uh, it's the bit that work on themselves. People miss, right? The idea of you said yourself leading yourself first. How many people have had leaders who talk one game, insist you do one thing, and yeah. then operate completely different? Right now. In the United Kingdom, we're in the throes of that, right? A Christmas party while everyone else is locked down is exactly that idea that one rule for you, different for me. And and the idea that you don't think that's going to have an impact on your people in terms of vaccine hesitancy and anything else is a lack of insight, deep insight and knowledge of yourself. Um, I found some of the recent events excruciating to watch, John from a, a personal level this is not a political statement because sometimes just from a human being perspective there is that lack of self-awareness and that lack of introspection which in turn may lead to lack of in, in uh, integrity and all of those things the human-centered piece is gone yeah yeah it, it, it. i think we have to face the fact that some people um this is that socialized versus personalized power element right. of leadership right that's what this is really it, it's a bunch of people who there they are ev i think every leader must embrace power every leader if they are to be effective must embrace power but some leaders embrace it for what it can do for them and and how it can allow them to disregard the norms and rules for everybody else and others embrace power for the ways that they can use it to help more universal thriving whether that's of their team of their organization of their community and what we are missing is people who operate on the basis of power as a means to if not universal at least broader thriving and this is why i was really excited to have this conversation with you john because you know, we haven't been able to see each other for a couple of years because of what's been going on the pandemic. You've been doing your work and I've been watching that with interest. Um, you know, I wrote my book a couple of years ago and have now started to do a lot of work into human centered leadership. How can people and organizations be a force for good? And so that's why I wanted us to tackle this question of leadership. So what? I've spent 81 episodes talking about leaders and leadership. So what? And I want to come to that, but I've got to ask one question. The promises of giants as an author, I know there's thought that goes into a title. Where did that title come from? So I've kind of described a, the half of it, the promises bit of it, which is the idea that leadership is a promise. That's fundamental. Leadership is a promise of a kind of experience, and yeah. that's what that's about. The giant's part is the fact that leaders are disproportionately powerful. Yeah. Almost everybody who plans to be in leadership would be better off imagining themselves huge, a giant 
I'm an actual giant trapped in the phantom zone of the virtual world, but I'm an actual giant, six foot nine, 26 stone. I'm an actual giant and I do not treat the world with yeah. such um, lack of vigilance as many. I'm vigilance. constantly aware of where my body is in the space when I'm when I am on those rare occasions in space with other people. I'm constantly aware of that. I'm constantly aware that I can do huge damage and not just on purpose but through thought thoughtlessness. And that's what it's about. You want to promise as a as a leader to deliver a kind of experience. You as a leader must embrace your power because there's nothing more dangerous than a giant that doesn't know they're a giant. And John, I've got to share this because we can have some fun with it. I mean, you are six foot nine and uh, you might remember, remember this? I do remember this was that. Asked a couple of, now I'm just over six foot and I was very proud of having got to that height, but there you are. At that six might foot be nine. the smallest I've ever looked. <laughs> Maybe it's the camera angle. I don't know. So, and also pre-beard. Yeah. Well, I, I think I look younger. Who knows? There we go. I've just got more gray hair, but... Um, you and me both. <laughs> there we go. Which is why it's great to connect again. Listen, your T-shirt, Accountability is Sexy. Tell me a little bit about that. You're so, wearing that for a reason. I have, uh, I have been, I, I make a point of trying to find cool and interesting T-shirts. I, I believe that part of the advantage of this world is we can abandon some of the non-functional traditions like wearing ties and wearing suits. I, I don't mean you don't have to look pre presentable and professional. But I think we need to understand that the power that is contained inside our colleagues' brains is not enhanced by clothing that is uncomfortable. So, but I'm trying to find things that I think have a message. And, and so I've okay. worn a lot of different t-shirts on television. <laughs> and, and this one I love because, again, if you think about the time we're in right now, and not just politically, there's a number of decisions that are being made by large businesses when it comes to their colleagues. A number of decisions being made around unionization and all kinds of other stuff that are going on right now in America. Accountability, right? Can we not just consider accountability, perhaps not sexy, but at least cool, right? The idea that owning what's yours, what's in your locus of control, that's yours. And if it goes, you know, badly, that's yours too. If it goes well, that should also be yours. I, I, I love accountability. The idea that we have a we have a bunch of um, we call them operational behaviors OB ones because we're nerds, right? <laughs> I'm going to come back to that, John. Because, but... because we're nerds, and one of our OB ones is is about it's reliability, and it's never say yes if it's a no. Okay. Never say yes if it's a no. There's something so amazing about knowing that people around you really own their accountability because you never feel like you're in it blindsided, let Watch down. That. It's wonderful as a colleague. Now, you've talked a little bit about your book, and I'm going to kind of just consolidate that for, for the listeners. So you focused in on 14 promises over three spheres. Is that right? The introspection, the interpersonal, and the organizational, which you exactly. described. Mm -hmm. So with all of that, I know the work that you've done over many years now, and having followed some of your work too, with all of that research that APS Intelligence does with the book that you've written, Let's get into that, that simple question, but naughty question, leadership. So what? Why is it so important right now? And why did you even talk about how you fill the leadership void? So what were you thinking? What is your point of view in relation to this void that exists and why leadership is so important? And there's, I know there's been some research as well from uh, uh, Emeritus that actually saying a lot of organizations are putting leadership right at the top. But I wonder if it's because they feel something as opposed to they know for sure that that has got to be the direction of travel. So I just want to try and get your point of view on some of that. Well, I mean, I think there's a decent evidence base showing that some of the characteristics of leadership are really important. We, we've been asking a lot of people, we have a, we have a community, Find Your Giant community, with a bunch of leaders in it. And we asked them the question about what leadership was, what got you to leadership in the past, yep. and what gets you to leadership in the future. I'll see if I can find it and throw it up here. Uh, because, are you going to use the, the wonders yeah, of the studio? It, it, You've got to do is, this. It is fascinating uh, when you look at what people, and these some of these people could be considered, I think people might look at them and think they're the crusty old guard of leadership. Okay. and and But, but they're not. They're, they're contemporary and they're serious about about becoming the leaders of the future. 
But we asked them about it and they said this, right? You know, some of these characteristics, charisma, confidence, experience, male yeah. and networking, the, you know, mo we know that a lot of these factors have little to no prediction for future performance. So we asked them about the, the, these are the old ways that people were made into leaders, and there's a myriad of reasons there. But then, and then we asked them, but what about the new ways? And and it was radically different. It was empathy, vision, emotional intelligence, honesty, compassion, collaboration, kindness. Uh. And this is why there's a leadership void. It's not a lack of um, there's not a lack of bosses. There's not a lack of powerful people being loud and assertive. There's a lack of empathy and and ambition m metered by compassion and drive, but not, you know, dr burnout. There's a, there's a lack of that kind of measured, directive, but coaching approach to... To thriving and you know, that's what I think everybody can deliver maybe not to everyone right so you've got this big reach now you, you've managed to your podcast now is is number one in leadership it's in, in the UK people are people are, are like clamoring for this stuff but your nice. so your but your sphere of influence is massive now compared right to other people who might be in a community or in a school or in a workplace where maybe it's just the four people who sit around them but imagine what happens when a bunch of people impact just the four people who sit around them. Remarkable things can happen. Uh, one of my colleagues did their dissertation on um, murmurations. Murmurations? Murmurations. You know, the, the movements of starlings in those yeah. big... Yeah. Oh, they're incredible to see, they're, aren't they? They're remarkable. I mean, they're just so beautiful. They're incredibly messy. You don't want to get caught into one, let me tell you that. But they look like a very organised system, don't they? But they, they do. And the amazing part about that is it's in in this person's research they were like it's just four birds have to communicate that's it you right. just influence the three birds around you and that creates that shape so look what happens people talk about in business people talk too much about the super tanker oh we can't move too fast we're a super tanker it's bollocks if you could get enough people to influence the three or four people just around them that's what leadership is, that distributed leadership model. It still requires solid leadership at the top and cool. strategic values and all this other stuff. But for people, we can all do that, right? Well, it means that anyone can be the change, right? Yes. Anyone could be that change agent to start off a movement. There's that wonderful video. I'm sure you've oh, seen yes. it. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> the, the moment awesome. you started, I was like, it's awesome. It's, yeah. it, no, I, if people don't know the video we're talking about, you can find this on YouTube. And it was from some outdoor uh, uh, a concert, wasn't it? And there's a there's a chap who's dancing all by himself without a care in the world. And then comes, so they call that the lone nut. And then they get the first follower. Yeah. The person who dances and with him. And then soon there is an entire it's a wonderful video. You've seen it, John, right? It is. It is tremendous. And it just, you know, th there's another element of this too, which is that you start off by influencing four people, but there is a contagion that yes. happens because people are drawn to these, because in leadership, we're not talking about dancing necessarily, but we're talking about the kind of accessibility of it, the the connectedness, the authenticity of it, the emotional literacy of it. That's what's drawing people in and oh, away I'm, from the opposite. You see, I knew I was going to love this conversation again, John. So I'm having a conversation with a lot of organizations and leaders about skills versus capabilities. Listen, you know, my background is as a trial lawyer. So when I was much younger, it was all about, I must acquire the skills, the technical skills in order to be confident and competent in front of judge and jury. And as life slides by and perhaps taking more leadership roles and, and being in positions where I have to challenge myself, as you've described, I now find myself really having to move towards more human-centered innate leadership capabilities the vulnerability the humility the curiosity the inclusivity what is my personal purpose in order to, for me to understand how can i be a force for good now i'm work in progress john but i'm having that conversation more which i'm finding encouraging more towards the capabilities and maybe some of those things that you saw in the work cloud as opposed to just those technical skills i'm a good lawyer i'm a good banker i'm a good architect these are important yeah but there's a change that is required i think we're all a work in progress i mean the, the, this is 
this is the era of learning, right? This is one of the things that workplaces have to get used to, the idea that the, um, the utilization approach to work is dead, right? Not only because of the increase in technology and offshoring yeah. and other things, but because, it's, you know, it, I think it was um, a McKinsey study from 2016, and it's been repeated by Deloitte more recently, yeah. talking about between 2016 and 2030, 75 to 375 million job roles globally will shift. Right. That is why utilization is dead. Spending time client facing or revenue producing is not the answer alone because organizations are going to have to shift and often quite dynamically. And so ongoing learning, not compliance learning, but learning so that there's future sustainability for an organization is going to be a part of it. I, I've forgotten the question we asked now because I, I digressed. It's That's why I, I love this because we're just having a conversation. <laughs> exactly. Digress. Well, I'm going to come back to something that you, you've just started me thinking about is people are talking about a new way of working. Nothing and no one is going to go back to the way it was pre pandemic. So there's going to be a new way of working. And a lot of people are saying, what does hybrid working look like? And how will we, you know, recruit talent? And will people come back to an office? Will people even live in the city or the country within which we all of these things are going on? I've had conversations, John, with some CEOs who are even saying to themselves, what is my value proposition? right now, having had two years in a different space. So what's the role of, of leaders and leadership now? Because have we got an opportunity to draw a line under some of the nonsense that did exist and an opportunity to change the chapter and change the song post pandemic? I don't know, because you would have done some research or you speak to people all the time. Any thoughts on this leadership and where we're headed? So we're stuck a little bit at the moment because we have a, a group of leaders who, although I think many of them aren't aware of it, are clinging to the past. That's why we use the terminology of the new normal. It's so reductive. It's so unambitious. It's a bungee cord connecting us to the past. That's what it is, <laughs> right? It, it, it's, it's leaders hoping that fundamentally... Back to the old. Omicron, Omicron's gone. Uh, and at some point, whether it's after this Christmas or after next summer everything goes back to normal. I can still arrive at seven. I can still make sure that no one leaves before I do. I can still eat a bad sandwich at lunch. That's what they're hoping. And that's gone. It's done. Yeah, it ain't going to happen. It's done forever. So now people, we've always known that people, we, that, that people leave uh, managers, not organizations. The thing that leaders need to remember is that right now we're in the great resignation, aren't we? Yes. I mean, I don't, you've seen the stats from America, right? I, I have seen them. What they're talking about up to, was it 44% attrition rates? It was all, in, in August of this year, 4.4% yep. of the entire American workforce resigned voluntarily. That number was a record and that was superseded the next month. The next month, we haven't got the December dates, wow. uh, uh, data yet, but people are leaving. And if people leave managers, what does this say? It's well, not just that they don't it's not just that everything's right. fine and rosy. Look around us. We've got a pandemic still on. It's not just that things are rosy, but people have decided that there's a new way. So if you want people to come back to the work to the, to an office, you know what you need to do? Make it compelling. Well, I think that in itself is a, a huge conundrum for businesses and traditional businesses who perhaps traded on the iconic brand or how they were perceived two or three years ago. But um, I've done some wonderful episodes, John. Let me just throw this into the mix. A wonderful lady, uh, uh, Raquel Ficardi, said, we're going to have five demographics working in a single organization for the first time ever. Age-wise. Uh, Age-wise. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, Gen, Gen Y will make up 75% of the, of the workforce by 2025. Yeah. The younger population is incredibly important, but they want something different. Yeah. What do they want? What are you hearing and seeing in your research and work, well, John? They, 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 they're not... You know, generalizations about gener generations are generally quite poor. That's a sentence I enjoy saying. I couldn't um, say that, so I'm glad you did. Yeah, but, it, <laughs> but, but what we do know is that they want congruence, right? Yeah. And so the problem that's been made here is not one of snowflakery from young people. It's, it's of the fact that as an older person, as older people as we are, we look at a website of a company and we know that it's marketing. Mm -hmm. And so when we arrive, we ameliorate our expectations of our direct line manager. 
And young people, they imagine that what you're selling in your website is true. And then they arrive and you've under-equipped, often a quite junior manager, to a point where the, the gap between what's promised, which is profound, yes. and what's experienced, which is terrible often, is so big that you immediately make plans to leave. And because we live in this world now, you make plans to spam to the rest of the universe that this is an organization that lies. That's right. I'm going now, to tell 4 million people that, on my route out. <laughs> yeah, there's only a couple of options if you want to change that. Stop lying about what you offer or train people so they can deliver it. And this comes back to that promise of a kind of experience, doesn't it, That's John? That's it. Look, look, and we do this exercise with some of our clients where we simply take one line from their career, usually from their careers page, yep. sometimes from their values page, one line with just one sentence, and we examine the cascade of implications from that one sentence. So uh, well, most most people actually use this this kind of phrase. Your manager will take an interest in your career. Right, okay. We've got a, a, a graphic that is a cascade of implications, uh, utilization, process, procedure, people, training, other stuff that all cascades from that. Because let's think about it. Your manager will take an interest in your career. That means you have to have at the very least, a manager who is willing to be interested in your career. You yep. have to have a manager who has time made to enable that, which isn't just time to have an ad hoc meeting, but time to plan for that meeting, create a plan, follow up on that. You see what I mean? I do. Instantly, this cascade of implications happens, and that's what you're promising. So if that's what you're promising, then deliver that. If you tell people the reason we need to be in the office is for collaboration, then you have to understand that Almost everybody now is sophisticated enough to know that sitting and watching a senior person write on a whiteboard is not collaboration. <laughs> you can you can make that room as colourful as you like. You can scent it as in the air, as as, as as some companies are doing. You can put a big technology screen there instead of a whiteboard, and I still know that I could have done this from home. Yeah. So if you want collaboration, if you want to tell me this collaboration, you have to show me that that's real. I can. I must be able to stick my hand up in the room, and speak my ideas without fear of sanction or compromise. That's that psychological safety piece as well. That's it. it. This that, is the promise, that, right? Culture. So I'm assuming, mm -hmm. always assume positive intent. I'm assuming that a lot of these companies, there was no mischief to what it was that they've written down on paper, but it's turned out to be rhetoric and platitudes. And as you do these exercises and you start to look at what are the consequences that flow from what it is that you're talking about. What happens when these organizations suddenly have the real, you know, suddenly realize when you take them through it, they think, I didn't think of that. Yep. Oh, we hadn't thought it through. What do they do? Well, the, we, 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 we quite, I quite flippantly, my colleagues are, are nicer, I think, but I quite flippantly say there are really only two choices. One, you can change what it says on your website, but yeah. you can't really do that because it's like an arms race out there, isn't it? <laughs> One technology, and, and now actually it's not, you know, it used to be within the sector an arms race. Mm -hmm. Now it's outside of sectors because somebody from retail is trying to steal somebody from technology. Somebody from technology is trying to steal somebody from engineering. Everybody's fighting with everybody. So you can't really change that. So instead you have to say, right, here is your opportunity for a systemic plan. Let's just focus on people and processes and maybe a bit of logistics because there's often some logistical elements to it. Okay. Let's focus on those three things and see if we can nip the low hanging fruit here to enable a better experience within three years. Because very, I mean, you know this better than me, very little in terms of organizational experience doesn't dip as you try an intervention before yep. it rises again. So that's what we we aim for, right? That, that really pragmatic approach to this. What are the actual levers we can pull to make a difference? And they will involve saying things like, right, inducting your new managers your brand new managers the people who were yesterday your mate yep and are now your manager inducting those people with an hour on the logistics and uh, you know with a legal briefing and an hr briefing is not going to cut it no you're going to have to really think about what skills they need minimum manage difficult conversations minimum inclusion and especially in this day and age race fluency minimum uh, minimum, you need to give them the skills to give great feedback because that's a lifesaver. And, and and you go on. That's the stuff, and that's where you start. And now you start saying this is not L and D is not a question of compliance. One option. It's now 
how do they deliver the experience and therefore it's a learning process it's a pedagogical process yeah you know we don't put kids in in school it's so so remarkable that in workplaces we think you know what i'll do i'll teach my organization to be anti-racist in an hour on thursday but in school (laughs) we recognize that these complex things these complex pedagogical uh, notions these pieces of learning they have to be done over time reinforced rehearsed yeah John, I, I want to pick up because you, you've just used a phrase and I, I'm kind of, I'm digressing now as well. You just used the term anti-racist and I know that you did that wonderful uh, BBC video. It was well, not about not being racist, it's about being anti-racist and that had millions of views, which actually I'm glad that had such uh, a high number. Just tell us a little bit about that because I, I, I'm hoping as well that in some ways organizations which are enormous levers for change can really start to win at inclusivity. They can really start to drive being a force for good. Thoughts on this, because I know that you've been a real commentator uh, and, and a really strong advocate for this, and it's been great to see, but just some thoughts. So I am interested. I'm not interested in creating come by our moments. Right. I'm not, I'm not a warm and fuzzy psychologist. I want to win. This inclusion narrative that I'm interested in, I talk about in the book, um, I have an entire chapter. Yeah. Where I talk vociferously about some of the ways that mistakes are made, but... I'm interested in this because it'll help us win. We need all the perspectives. You know, here we are, there's a problem or a challenge here in the middle of the room, and we need every perspective of this observed. And not just that, we need everybody to be able to speak up. This is about winning. When it comes to anti-racism, it is, there is pervasive racism in this world. I know this because the video that I put out about not being racist yes, attracted yes. itself a really vociferous backlash from racist people on social media, uh, people sending me cards to my office address, and not very nice ones. Yeah. And this is work we must do because there are brilliant brains that come in packages that you don't expect. And don't you want to have those brilliant brains next to you? Yeah. Even if there's a little bit of friction because of the differences in personality, neurological style, cognitive style, personality, race, gender, whatever. That friction is how you are able to really eviscerate bad ideas. Make sure that bad decisions never make it out of that room. And make sure that the best possible ide- uh, decisions are made with most with the most available information. That's what this is about. Yeah. Being anti-racist shouldn't be hard. Being anti-misogynist should be hard. Racism is is an offense against human dignity, not just against black people's human dignity and brown people's human dignity, against all. Misogyny and sexism is an assault on all people's human dignity. Racism, uh, sorry, transphobia, homophobia, ableism, anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, doesn't matter what it is. These are assaults on human dignity and we should all be nothing but anti against and vehemently so now i'm glad i asked you that question because i know how passionate and how eloquent you are in relation to that subject and actually for people to see the humanity as opposed to the difference my word are we so quick to see the difference and i remember seeing that in you know i've spoken before i wrote in my book when i had the opportunity to go to the genocide museum in rwanda and to understand some of the history about how that came about and that long story short and i think nearly a million people were, were murdering friends and family in, in 100 days of anyone. And that's 1994. John, that's well within your and my lifetime. Oh, exactly. And, and so I, I'm horrified on many occasions as to what I see, what I hear. And it it, it breaks my heart as well that the, the messages that you've been putting out and, and the videos that you've done, and then you've had that just horrific backlash from people who just... I mean, so when we come back to leaders and leadership, if if organizations can be a force for good and they need to win at inclusivity, what do they need to start doing, John? Um, Give them a, and it's such a, it, as I know it's a crazy question to ask, but get them started. All right, so, so we, we have something we call an integrated inclusion approach, right? Okay. We, we, we use this with a lot of things. And, <laughs> there and it is. There it is on the screen, right? So framing. We need to stop talking about the right thing to do because it doesn't matter. And I know that seems harsh for people. It doesn't matter because if it matters, we'd have done it by now. Okay. Right? Um, So let's stop. Let's talk about the performance prerogative and not just that kind of banal and generic diversity helps performance because actually you and I both know diversity doesn't. Inclusion and diversity does. I agree. But not just diversity on its own. So 
talk about it really specifically, but then don't allow the sea lining. Don't allow people to say, oh, show me the evidence because there's an internet. Go to work. Then there's data. Organizations. Now, in the UK and the United States, it's relatively easy to gather data. In other countries, we work, and like you, uh, internationally. And so, you know, you go to France and Germany, there are some real challenges, but there are still ways to get better, more granular data. We know that one of the things we can do is stop imagining that all black and brown people are the same. So not using terms like BAME and, you know, because it's, it's a statistical convenience, isn't it, really, BAME? So, so rather than do that, look at the granularity of it to help okay. you understand some of the things that are going on. For example, in, in British professional services, black people are, are African people are over I mean, black people are wildly underrepresented in senior leadership positions. But yep. if they're there, they are black African, not black Caribbean. And that's right. an important thing for us to understand. Targets. Targets are, um, I hate targets. <laughs> they, they are clunky, blunt instruments. They cause people who have worked incredibly hard, who are the target of targets, if you like, to yep. feel like their achievements are maligned. It causes people who are not the target of targets, the, the majority population, to feel like uh, they're being hard done to. But you know what the only thing that's been proven to work in the last 20 years is? targets <laughs> so we need them until that we need them until there's more sophistication in the system till we've got better data until we've got more objective means of systems and processes which is the next thing right how about we relook at the criteria for the jobs especially in this market where we know this 375 million people globally are going to shift roles perhaps the actual technical requirements of that job and not a broader set of what you called before capabilities is going to be a more important things because most people if they've got into the world of work, they can learn new stuff. Yep. And we're going to have to. So let's rethink systems and processes to take away some of the bias that is embedded in it. Some of the descriptions of leaders which are so clearly skewed towards maleness and actually a certain type of maleness. Let's get rid of that. Let's talk about colleague accountability. Let's make it so everyone is a leader. Every single person knows it's their responsibility if they're in an open plan office or if they're at home. On that team's call, they need to imagine the four squares next to them. That's their responsibility. I'm leading this group. So my job is to role model the behaviors I want to see, yeah. to challenge the behaviors I don't want to see. That's my job. It's not HR's job. It's not the DNI person's job. It's not the affinity group's job. It's my job. Well, that's infectious, isn't it, John? If Absolutely everyone's doing it that. is. Absolutely it is. And it's one of the things that marks you out as part of the organization. Then there's the leadership imperative, and I've gone on too long about this. But then there's the idea that you shouldn't be, a, in a world where inclusion is important to you, from a performance prerogative point of view, you shouldn't be able to ascend to leadership if you don't have skills, capabilities in this area. See, I knew I was going to have fun, on, as I say, on this one, and I'm feverishly making notes as I, as I go here, here John. And let me ask you a, probably another unfair question as well, in the context of leadership, so what? Um, you've been talking about your book and referencing that and using that in, in the work that you do. Has there been, has one of the promises stood out? Maybe not from you talking about it, but from people asking about it or fixing on it. Have, have you had any surprises since you let the book uh, out on release that people have really zoned in on elements of it and you thought that's interesting or surprising? Yeah, I, I suppose I've been, I've been really thrilled with the response, I'll, I'll be honest. I. I've been thrilled, yeah. and um, I will warn you now that I can hear that Covent Garden is coming alive <laughs> around me here. So I apologise. You'll we hear should noise. say you are bang in central London. I India. am indeed, and and there are revelers on this Friday night <laughs> that I can hear already. Does nobody have a real job anyway? Well, I don't uh, know. I thought I right? thought there was a virus. So anyway, I know, right? We should be a bit more careful. But the, the thing, there's a couple that I really. Have, have enjoyed that people have really embraced. Yeah. In chapter one, I talk about, I promise to view myself critically, not cruelly. Yes, I love and this. I, and I, I just think it's, it's, it's resonated so well with people because I think people have started to realize that there are a couple of different types of approaches to self assessment, right? One of them is the people that you meet who, who don't know that they have any flaws at all. <laughs> they they think they are flawless and perfect and brilliant at everything. I, I would love to know what that feels like, John. And so I would want I to be that, but how, so how do you, would I? It's an but, but I, I think I, I think actually I think I don't think I'd enjoy it because I don't think delusion is for me. 
I, I don't think delusion is for me. You know, I, I want, but I think that's actually a very small percentage. I think yeah. they're quite notable, and so there's the kind of because it's so marked, it feels like there's more. But I think it's a small percentage, mm. and then there's this huge percentage of people who self-flagellate. You give them a compliment, and they say, "Oh no, no, not me." And, yeah. and you just want to say to them, you want to grab them by the shoulders and say, look, you have been brilliant at this very specific thing. Not good job stuff. You've been really good at this specific thing. Own this credit. It is due to you. Yeah. Uh, there are people out there who they make a mistake and they catastrophize it and it explodes inside their brain and causes them in, in, in innumerable harm. And, and I just love the fact that people have looked at this chapter and realized they can critique their mistakes they can challenge the things that they need to develop and they can still see themselves as an accomplished person with abilities be I kind to that. yourself right yeah but it, it's not it's not a blind kindness no it's not just i'm ignoring it's it's you can still know that there's stuff you're not good at you can still know there's stuff that you've never been good at but it doesn't change the fact that you have other merits and and that you, as long as you're looking at yourself objectively and critically, you don't need to self-flagellate. You don't need to punish yourself. It's uh, tough, frankly. isn't it? Sometimes to silence the inner critic. We, we've all been there. Um, I think it's probably something I'm still working on. And and that also, I, I'm going to jump now to. There was a part of your book that also immediately resonated with me. Was that promise to tend to the mind and body? That's a, that's it's, exactly where I was going to go. Adam. Oh, okay. <laughs> because I remember when we had that conversation, and this really dovetails into leadership is energy expensive it is so it is. so so brace up buckle up get ready for it but look after yourself as well it's hugely energy expensive i saw this i don't know who did this but i saw this graphic uh that i stole the other day which is a picture of a bucket pouring yeah. onto some onto some uh some earth feet watering the plants but the idea there's a hose going into the bucket and so i've been talking to the people who follow me on social media and talking about you can't pour from an empty cup right yeah. you, you, you've got to make sure as a leader this is hugely energy expensive if you want to do your job well you i was just talking about actually with a i sit on a footsie board i was talking to one of our executives about yeah. this just before this call you have got to take care of yourself and i'm not this is not being generous to you and it's not being selfish on your behalf it's so that you can deliver for this organization and yes. for the people who are going to need you at your very best and I've loved the fact that people have finally given themselves permission. These 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 uh, leaders who are parents of children, as well as leaders of big groups of people, and who are working all the way through the weekend and spending every moment with their kids, and and they don't. I'm telling them, look, it, there is a point. I'm not telling you to abdicate your responsibility as a parent, but there are times when you need to say, actually, if I run, the one there's one person I talked to loves to run, but stopped running and wondered why their life felt like it was spiraling a little bit. They, they were getting short tempered. And I was like, well, have you ever thought that maybe if you got to do the thing that you loved even twice a week, yeah, might you be a better leader on the Tuesday and Wednesday after that, on the Thursday and Friday after that Wednesday run? And I love the fact that people have permissioned themselves to fill their cup so that they can water their people. They can really deliver for their people. Now, we've just touched on a few. There are 14 promises within the book, the promises of giants. Mm -hmm. uh, John, do that great thing again. Go and put it up on the screen. The, the there it is. There's... There it is. So you can get that. Well, you know where you can get that. <laughs> For Lord's sake, everyone knows where you can get a good book from. And I know that's doing very well. I know uh, Adam Grant as well um, spoke very highly of it. It was on his reading list, wasn't it, John? He did. Uh, I've, I've I've just had a ch I had a chat with him recently, and I'm going to talk to him again in the giant community uh, yep. in, in February. And he's like, "This is he." When he wrote this, I was like, "Wow, that's that's this is one of the most powerful books ever written about leadership." I was I was utterly thrilled. That's because pretty good, it's right? A, it is a weird book, right? Because it's you know me well enough to know I'm an oddball, and I don't you know even the way it's framed as promises is probably not what most people expect. Um, the fact that it's got exercises in it, so it's not just for you to read yep. and kind of, you know, then throw away. It's something for you to read and read again and do the exercises and read again and do more exercises because that's what development and leadership is. John, I have to ask this question. You've had done a number of videos 
about Jedi reflections. Mm. And, and you even have on your bio, uh, Everyday Jedi. And we've got some wonderful things behind you by your book as well. Yoda, amongst other things. Do I see a lightsaber? Yoda, and... this, this is a lightsaber. It's just... Oh. <laughs> Great. This... So this is only one of three of my lightsabers currently. There we go. Only one of three. I think in that in that picture that I had. Here we go. Pull up. Put that back up there. I think I think there were some things on the shelves as well. Yes. There. Yes. There's it a is. bunch. <laughs> it's, it's it's Marvel on the top, Star Wars in the middle, and then now I've got another row underneath it as well. There you go. That reminds me, as I say, of that meeting. But tell me a little bit about um, Jedi reflections and the fun fact. You've got to explain the fun fact to the listeners as well. Mark Hamill of all people. Yes, so I'll do the Mark Hamill first. The the Mark Hamill. Uh, I don't know how it happened. Um, I, I think I, I did a, like a little feature. Uh, they did an interview for me in the Guardian, um, and on that day, it was in the obviously on social media, and, and one of my followers added added Mark Hamill to say this guy's a, a proper Jedi, right? And, and he wrote back and 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 said. Yes, he is. I endorse him as a Jedi. And I was like, oh, my God. Well, now, just, well, just help people who don't know, there are some. Mark that Hamill. shouldn't be allowed, by the way. There I shouldn't know. be. Any. Mark Hamill is a remarkable human being. He's also the actor who played Luke Skywalker, continued yeah, to play did. Luke Skywalker all the way through. Um, but he's also a pretty, if you follow him on social media, he's a pretty remarkable person in terms of his activism and, and uh, social justice uh, activities. It's just really remarkable. But... I um I am a child again every time I think about the fact that he knows my name. Yeah, I I, I don't know what to say. I can't really feel. Now it takes me back when I walked into your flat. I remember John and you kindly showed me around, and I think the first thing that caught my eye. I hope you don't mind mentioning this was this wonderful picture of you and Barack Obama. Yeah, and I thought. Oh wow! <laughs> I I, oh, that, I, got, that, I was a, I was a little bit kind of I'm not sure what to do now. Um, how shall I how shall I run this particular interview for the book? That, that well, that's that's the that's the that's the difficulty. The 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 Barack Obama one happened at the end of his his um his second term. He was in England. Um, it was during the Brexit throws uh, initially, yeah. and and. Uh, I went to an event where he was where he was speaking to school kids, and I was invited by the the uh, embassy here. Um, I came along and I sat down. And I was really annoyed because I had terrible seats. I couldn't I couldn't see. I mean, because I'm tall, I could see, but the kids were all up front. And I was like, "This is bad." And then, half what felt like halfway through him speaking, some somebody came and tapped me on the shoulder, dragged me off, and I was like, "I'm trying to listen to this man." Yeah. And so they took me into a room, and I look around, and it's uh, Stanley Tucci, it's Annie Lennox, it's a bunch of famous people. And then I realize this is the kind of introduction room. He, he comes in uh, moments later and says hello to all of them first, yep. none of whom talk to me, by the way, in the room. <laughs> but anyway, talk to all of them first, and then he spent 15 minutes with me when they'd all gone. It was wow. just really lovely. It was really wow. lovely. These are great stories and stories, I hope, for another episode. Um, listen, how can people get in touch with you and carry on the conversation, really dovetail into the research you're doing, the work you're doing? Best way of listeners getting in touch with you, John? Yep. So the, the best way, I mean, social media, it's my name, John Amici, yep. uh, or APS Intel uh, is our tag on social media. Or you can go to findyourgiant.com. Findyourgiant.com. I'm easy to get hold of. That's the giant community right there. That's yes? it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Listen, it's been wonderful again, John. Thank you for agreeing yet again to have a conversation. Let me do this. Not only the book, but second time on the podcast. And that, thank you for being a great friend and supporter of the Leadership Enigma. Much appreciated. Hope you've enjoyed it. Always. Take great care. Join us again next week for more tips and strategies on the Leadership Enigma. We'd love to hear your comments on today's show, as well as suggestions for future topics and guests. Get in touch with your host on LinkedIn or visit the dedicated website, www.leadersenigma.com, powered by Transform Performance International, where you can access our exclusive learning, including books, videos, bonus content, assessments, and more. Please don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe on all your major podcast platforms. Thanks for listening.